Hi, I'm Nadine Aisha Jasset, and welcome to this video from the National Library of Scotland's Fresh Ink Initiative, where 10 emerging writers create and share new work on their experience of 2020. Samantha Clark is a visual artist and writer based in Orkney. Sam received a Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award in 2018 and a Scottish Emerging Writers Residency at Cove Park in 2020. Her first book, The Clearing, was published by Little Brown in March 2020. The writing of Sam's piece, Treading Water, flows and moves like the water itself as Sam takes us lyrically and powerfully into her world, her evocative writing making her feet our feet as we tread the Orkney coast alongside her, flowing with its tides and sitting with her reflections. Here's Sam reading an extract from Treading Water. The numbers of the dead go on rising. They are counted, but they're not named. Time feels different this summer, like a stuck clock ticking the same second over and over. The calendar on our kitchen wall does not fill up the scribbled appointments, concert dates, dinners with friends. The usual stream of visitors that make our short, bright, Orkney summer so convivial do not arrive in jovial carloads from the ferry bearing bottles of wine, hugs, laughter. We too go quietly along. The mild days of early summer pass pleasantly enough. Let the hens out, open the polytunnel, water the seedlings, make the coffee, Butter the toast, open the laptop, work till lunchtime, stop to lift a few beetroot or new potatoes, wash and prepare them, set out the lunch things with a jug of water. We sit at the table, each in our habitual chair, and exchange some quiet chat about the day. Then Andrew goes back to his desk and I wash the dishes and go back to mine. Work till evening. He cooks dinner. I wash up. Some television. A book, maybe. Bed. And so it goes. We count our blessings. Most days I walk the mile or so up to the North Shore to look at the sea, then turn back for home. Sun on my left cheek, then on my right. Sometimes I go for a swim, sometimes a spin on the bike. Sometimes I drive to the co-op. The green strip down the middle of our track grows so tall it tickles the sump on my van. I leave a trail of beheaded oxeye daisies and red clover behind me. The water is always there, all around us. Every day I watch it. The rushing burn beside the track. The spring that seeps out of the ground in our neighbour's field and gushes sweetly from a pipe nearby. The wide expanse of freshwater loch that fills the southeast facing windows of our sitting room with its movement. The wind-driven rain that batters the roof lights. The surging sea I walk beside most days. There's a lot to keep an eye on. There's a lot to think about. The earliest clocks used water to measure the flow of time. In ancient Babylon, Egypt and Rome, a clepsydra, or water thief, marked time as water dripped through a small hole from one earthen vessel into another where it was measured. Time became substance, and that substance was water. Every day I watch the water, and then I try to draw it. The first real warm day of summer makes time loop, bringing this time last year bright in memory. My niece, Zoe, 
running on the beach, three years old, on her first visit to Orkney. The sun is bright on the wet sand and she has pulled off her shoes and made straight for the water, casting off all her clothes as she runs and now she is jumping and splashing in the shallows, naked, running, falling, laughing, clowning, prancing, rolling, dancing, her plump little bottom and chubby baby hands caked in sand, her soft hair falling in wet tangles. She waves her bedraggled mermaid doll in the air in jubilation and shouts, happy, happy, fun, this is fun, at the top of her voice. Her delight is infectious. She is incandescent with joy. Passers-by cannot help but smile at the sight of her. The water's cold and she shrieks with the sting of it, teeth chattering, but she doesn't want to come out. My brother, trousers rolled to the knee, tries to hold her still long enough to smear on some sunscreen, but he might as well try and catch hold of a live eel. She is more exuberantly alive in that moment than anything I have ever seen, running on the strand, aflame with delight. Her name means life. I am afraid to love her. I fear we will not be able to protect her. They say the sea will cover this beach one day and not recede. Already the coastal archaeology of these islands is vanishing, eaten away by high tides and storm surges. I check the maps and the predictions to see how long we've got. It's not long enough. For me, perhaps, but not for Zoe. This summer, my brother sends me photographs so I can see how tall she's growing. I watch the water and then I try to draw it. Yesterday I soaked some paper, stretched it over a board and taped it all around the edges. Now it has shrunk drum tight as it dried overnight. Today I squeeze out a round pea of Payne's grey from an old tube of paint that's gone a bit claggy, mix it with a smudge of Prussian blue, some water and add a slosh of old tea, a good strong brew. The tannins in the tea will make the pigment clump into granules as it dries and, if I'm lucky and it goes right, it will leave tiny reticulated marks behind the receding tide of evaporating water in fine sedimentary layers. But the softly blurred shapes and grainy textures the paint makes are just a starting point, a hunch, a hint. Now I have to take things in hand. It can take a while to work out what to do next. I pin the sheets up around the studio so I'll come upon them unexpectedly from different angles or in different corners. That way I hope I'll see what they need. Then the work really starts, drawing over them, drop by drop, layer by layer, line by line, gathering up time. I dreamt last night I was in a flooded city. The water kept coming fast and deep. The city was deserted. All the other people had left, heeding warnings of catastrophe, but for some reason I had lingered, and now I was trapped. The water was rising. It was coming from all directions at once, gushing down motorways, smashing between buildings, cascading off concrete flyovers to crash down on the streets below in a huge slow motion cataract. There were many strange and exotic animals swimming away from the city as if from a flooded zoo. A long row of elephants held their trunks high as their big legs beat the water. There were rhinoceroses too, zebras and hippos all swimming hard. After these, other beasts began to emerge, now strange and mythical. Krakens, unicorns and griffins 
manticores and basilisks, creatures horned and tentacled and scaled, all came creeping silently from doorways and trapdoors and bunkers and swam away. All the wild animals of the world and of the mind were swimming away from the city, leaving me stranded and frightened among the grey concrete and the swirling brown water. Mist on the loch this morning and an eerie stillness. Words have gummed up. They don't flow today. Everything's grey. There was a man fishing the loch earlier. He sat alone in his boat, very still, casting into the har. He's gone now. There is only the white sky and a faint shiver of white water through white mist. Grey gulls dip and wade in the shallows. The whole world seems to float. To be folded inside a mist out on a hill or on the open sea is to be disoriented and exposed to danger, but here, at home by this loch, I am hidden by the thick fog, and the danger is elsewhere. It cannot find me here. Held between water that's half sky and sky that is half water. No one can see me here. I am safe. I am safe. Can I hide here until the danger is past? <laughs>